Uh, so before I start, I just like quick show of hands, like who have used Docker before? And, uh, so not many people have used Docker before. So okay, but it's okay. So the so um most of the time, right? You you have been running applications of what what they call bare metal, which is basically you install your dependencies and your application, and then you run it directly off your OS. So the good points about this is that you get the best performance you can get based off your machine. But the only problem is dependency hell. If you want to move this application to, say, another machine, you have to install tons of things. And if you have very complicated um, dependency, it makes things worse. So people came up with the idea of virtual machine, which basically you emulate a hardware layer and you run another OS on top of your OS. So it's kind of nicer because you can like, move your whole virtual machine to another machine. But the only problem is you suffer in terms of performance. So now we have a new, not really new, but new uh, thing called containers where you can run your applications and dependencies sandboxed together, separate from your base OS, and you don't lose any performance. It's all it's as good as your bare metal performance. How do we do this? It's um, basically using some of the features of the Linux kernel. So there are, there are two containers technology I will talk about, namely Lex C and Docker, which is the main point of this talk. Um, Lex C is, um, okay, wait. Before I do that, let me talk about CH root first, which is like the original idea to, to want to uh, virtualize your run, runtime environment. CH root basically changes, um, so you can CH root a process, and then the process will think uh, your root directory is somewhere else instead of your actual root. So uh, let me show you an example. So before you can even run CH root, you need to prepare a bunch of stuff. Like for example, I want to run bash and the ls command inside a, a, a ch root jail. So before I can do that, I need to copy the bash ex uh, binary and all, all these like um, dependent libraries into a root into a jail directory, which I've created at the top, which is home slash jail. Uh, as you can see, it's not very user friendly. And then after that, I can finally ch root. So I run sudo ch root to my jail directory and I run bash. As you can see, if you do a pwd, your, it thinks you're at root, and if you do an ls, it, it's only all these things and nothing else. But you can, t but you, it's very easy to tell in a ch root because if you do an echo of your current PID, some rather big number, and you can actually escape. You can jailbreak out of ch root relatively easily with this with this um, C program. Uh, so how it works is first, it needs to set the UID to zero, which is the root user, and then Okay, this is how basically how it works. Like you have to create a temp directory and then you cd into the temp directory, uh, ch root into the temp directory. And before that, you open a handle to your original root. Because when you ch root, um, file descriptors are not closed. So you can just jump out to the, to the previous uh, root. And at this point, you've already escaped from the jail. And if you scroll down the code, I don't know what happens. Ah, if you scroll down further, you can just go up, up, up all the way to your root. And then you can do RMRF, and that's, that's the end of it. <laughs> so I think if I, if I play this here, you can see this in action. I hope you can, oh goodness, I can't really read. Can you see the text? So anyway, this is the jail directory that I've created. And now I see it's root. And then if you do else, AL is just the root stuff. When you do PWD, you do this at root. I'll run that um, C program that I showed you just now. And then it's still at root, but it's now the actual root of my system. It's no longer the jail, uh, jail the process in. See, all the my Linux kernel, everything is there. So this is the beginning of um, the first step into virtualization. So now I'm ready to talk about Let's see. So let, how, uh, a Lexi is basically, you can think of it as a virtual machine, but without emulating another hardware layer. And, um, and then you can install your, uh, your dependencies like uh, whatever binaries you need, and then you run your applications, and it, it behaves as though it's another virtual machine, but it doesn't need to emulate uh, a, a hardware layer. How does it do that? It makes use of all these Linux kernel features, which I, I today I'll be talking about namespaces and control groups. The rest, uh, and CH root, which I've said something about before. The only problem with Lexi is that it's quite difficult to use. The documentation is rather terrible. If you go to the Lexi website, and it's because it's developed by Canonical, so it only works with Ubuntu first. And if you're using Red Hat, good luck. You have to figure it out for yourself. Which is why it hasn't been as popular as Docker, which more people have heard about. 
So uh, first I'll talk about namespaces. There's a bunch of links you can read out on namespaces. It's a kernel feature where it allows you to place your processes in in um, another namespace where you'll get a copy of all these things that the kernel provides, like um, the UTS, all these. Uh, I won't go too much into details about that because it's quite dry. And, but I'll show you, I'll demonstrate um, primarily the PID namespace and the mount namespace. So PID is processes and mount is like uh, mount points file systems. So here's, yeah, also like to find out what namespace your process is in, you can just do an LSAL for slash prop slash self slash NS. You can replace self with any PID and then you can see all this. These are all the namespaces that this process belongs to. A namespace is just a number, an ID, it doesn't have a name. So it's a nameless namespace of sorts, yeah. And so here's a demonstration for the PID namespace. So at the start, uh, I'll just show my own PID, which is some rather big number. And then, if I do a tree of the proc self NS, you can see all the various namespace that this process belongs to. And then um, there's, there's a small C program that just spawns a new process with a new uh, PID namespace, and then run the best shell after that. And you have to do it with sudo because you need um, the sysadmin capability which a root user will have. So you can, as you can see, this is the PID of the parent and this is the PID of a child from the perspective of the parent. But from the perspective of a child, it's now PID 1 because it, it has its own set of PIDs now. It's in another namespace. So if you do a tree of prop slash self slash namespace, you can see all this. But you can't really tell what the difference is, so I'm going to diff them. Oh yeah, and the PID is one. So I'm going to diff the tree between the parent and the and the child. You can look, you can see the diff. They they now belong to different PID namespaces. The rest of the namespaces are the same. But something curious is going to happen. I'm going to run top, which display the processes running on my machine. How come the child can still see all the processes running on the machine even though it's in another PID namespace? Uh, the answer is simple because top reads from the slash prop mount point to look for all the processes that are running on the machine. And because we haven't uh, created uh, another mount namespace for this process, therefore you can still see all the processes running on your machine. So in the next demonstration, it's going to start a bash shell in a new PID and a mount namespace. Uh, So yeah, this is the top from parent. You can see all these things running. And then I'm going to run another C program to start it in a names, uh, different namespace. As you can see, the PID is now one. And when I run top, you can only see the best shell and top and nothing else. Because I've mounted in another uh, mount namespace. So yeah, that's about that's it for namespace for me. Um, if I have time, I'll talk more about the different namespace types. But there's, there's quite a few. Uh, I don't think we have enough time now. Yeah. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, control group or C groups. So um, throughout the history of um, Unix and Linux, there's been like a desire for, by the OS developers to be able to classify processes based on hierarchy, like process one has a child, process two, etc and by organizational purposes, like this is a shell process, this is a daemon process, etc. And um, as you can tell from this already, a process can belong to more than one hierarchy. So how do we do that uh, easily? So the Linux kernel developers came up with the con uh, concept of C groups, which allows you to uh, classify, not classify, but put processes in multiple hierarchies. So a C group is also known as a hierarchy. They use this, these two terms interchangeably. And it's uh, primarily used by the Linux kernel subsystems, which I will talk about later on. So what's the difference between a process and a C group? In a, in a Linux um, OS, um, when, the, when you boot up your machine, the, there will be a process called the init process, which is started by the kernel. And most commonly nowadays, we use something called system D, which is rather controversial if you look it up. Um, so, so system D will have the PID of number one, and, and it has a very special um, uh, responsibility. It is responsible for spawning everything else your Linux kernel runs, 
and it also has the additional um, responsibility of reaping uh, processes. So what, what is reaping a process? So um, when when I <laughs> when a process spawns a child, and the parent process dies, the kernel will automatic automatically reparent the child process to PID one, and then the PID one now has the responsibility of um, ensuring that the child process dies normally. So uh, in a in a Unix or probably Linux a Linux world, um, before a process can die, the parent process must wait for its um, return code and other some other statistic. Otherwise, you will live on in the kernel as a zombie process. So if you run if you do ps grep z, you will see some uh, zombie processes hanging around. Those processes haven't been reclaimed by your init process. So yeah, so that's the special responsibility of. Uh, of the init process. This will become important later on when I talk about Docker. Ooh. What happened? Yeah, so um, a process can only have one parent, but a process can be multiple C groups or hierarchies, and both are in hierarch hierarchical in nature. So, how does C group work? C group works by a virtual file system which is mounted by systemd at this path, and everything like adding a process to a C group removing a C group, creating a C group is done by creating a folder in this mount point or uh, editing a file. Yeah, and, and because um, this is a virtual file system, is uh, well, this virtual file system is lost upon a, a reboot. So on my Ubuntu uh, 16.04 machine, if you run this command, you can see all the C groups that I have on my machine. So these, are, most of them are, are created by the sub Linux subsystem, except for this one, which is created by the system D init process. And if you look at the system D C group, you can see all these files. The red bolded text are, are folders, the rest are all files, are directories, yeah. So yeah, the, these files, the directories are basically child C groups because a C group can have children as well. And, and the task file is just a text file with a list of PID that belongs to it. And the C group is a list of thread group PID. So the difference between a PID and a thread group PID is that um, in Linux, every thread has a PID. So uh, yeah, and then a thread group ID just says like this process parents is this is this uh, PID. And then the rest of the files are probably are specific to the subsystem and generally not interesting. So yeah, you, you can see the type of subsystems you have on your machine by running this command. So you can see. Uh, these are all the subsystems of my machine. Um, yeah, I won't go too much into the details of the subsystems because they are quite dry. Yeah, and you can see the C group and subsystem for a process by running this command. So yeah, in, in Linux 4.4, all these bunch of, of um, subsystem, each subsystem will create a C group and then it will place processes inside the C group based on its hierarchy. So some subsystem don't really do much, they just collect data like CPU accounting. It just collects like, how much CPU time you have, you have spent. And some subsystem um, con impose controls like how much CPU time you can use, how much memory you can allocate. And some subsystems do freezing and thawing of processes like the freezer subsystem. Some subsystem make use of the entire hierarchy of the C group, some they just don't bother. So it, it, it's just, so C group is basically just a generalized hierarchy of processes that subsystems may or may not want to use feature. Yeah, so if you've seen the previous slide, I said V1, so there's a V2 now. Um, I don't think any, at least Ubuntu is not using V2 at the moment. So because as you see, V1 has many, many C groups for many, many subsystems. So they, the, there's a wish for them to unify all that of them into one single hierarchy. So you can only have one hierarchy, which is what V2 is supposed to do. But um, there is not much use for it yet. So all these these two um, features of the Linux kernel are basically what powers Docker. It allows them to um, run processes in its own little sandbox and, and doesn't allow it to affect the rest of your OS. The, the difference between Docker and Lexi is that Lexi is supposed to run sort of like a virtual machine without the hardware emulation overhead. Whereas Docker is supposed to let you run one single application inside a container. So by the, also by default, Docker doesn't do storage persistence unless you change some commands. So here's a, a diagram about the key differences between Lexi and Docker. Uh, as you can see, 
Lexi is designed for running a virtual a VM without the hardware emulation overhead, whereas Docker is meant to run applications. So Docker used to use um, Lexi as its, as its containerizing um, driver of sorts, but um, in recent times, the, the authors of Docker have abstracted this out into something called lit container, which still uses Lexi on, on Linux to run uh, its containers. But the, 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 the hope is that in the future, if someone wants to run Docker on Windows, then someone can write uh, an execution driver for that. So yeah, th these are the features of the Linux kernel that Lexi uses. So how does Docker deal with um, data? It uses a bunch of layers that are all read-only, and then it stacks them up together to give you a unified view of your file system. So when you run a container, uh, it creates a, a thin container area that's read and write for you to change your data, which is then thrown away when the Docker is re uh, when the container is removed. And below the container is is a read-only image like this Ubuntu 15.04 image, which are all the layers are read-only and they are addressed by cryptographic uh, content hashes. So uh, as you can see, the the system works with a copy or write uh, algorithm. So if you if you want to modify a file. You copy a version of that file all the way at the top layer, and you modify it there. So if you want to create a, a layer based off the Ubuntu-based image, and you change some files, only the changed files will, will exist in this top layer, whereas the rest of it are unchanged. It's basically reusing the same layers. So Docker uses a bunch of, allows you to use a bunch of different storage drivers, which you can choose based off this table. But today I'm going to talk about the AUFS uh, driver. AUFS stands for Advanced Multi-Layer Unification File System. <laughs> I, I think it used to stand for another union file system, but now they, I thought, they thought it was not cool enough. So um, AUFS is, was the first driver that Docker used. So you can see that it basically maps one-to-one -one with the Docker uh, image layering feature. Uh, so at the top of it, you access the AUFS system using a, something called union mount point which shows you a unified view of all these different layers. Uh, AUFS calls these layers branches. So yeah, these are all, each branch basically corresponds to a directory on your, on your actual file system. So what happens when you want to modify a file? Say I want to modify file 4 at this layer. So basically I just copy it up and then I modify it. What if I want to modify it at the container layer? I just copy it up again and I modify it. And the AUFS file system will, uh, will just go down from the top layer to the bottom and find the first file that it sees, and that there will be the version of the file you see. The only problem is, what, what if you want to delete a file? So, so AOFS uses something called wipe out file to say that this file is no longer existing. So like, the container wants to delete this file, just puts out a wipe, wipe out file, and then, and then AOFS will report that the file is no longer there. So the only problem with Docker is that it makes um, running some applications needlessly complicated. And the first one is uh, the zombie reaping issue. Because um, by right, well, the idea for Docker is that you want one single process inside your container. But as we know that there are many, uh, many processes spawn of the child processes, like Nginx, for example. And if your, the par parent process that you spawn of um, receives a zombie child, it probably doesn't know that it needs to reap it. Otherwise, it will, the zombie child will uh, linger around in the, in the kernel as a zombie, uh, and it will never be reclaimed by the, by the kernel, because the kernel doesn't do it automatically. And so the good guys at Fusion has come out of this base image docker, which helps you deal with it with a, with a hundred line plus um, Python script. And I'm going to demonstrate later about how complicated, how many containers you need to spin up just to run a simple Rails application with uh, Nginx reverse proxy and SSL certificate. Uh, yeah. So is that complicated? Why still use Docker? Yeah, yeah. The the, the problem is. The whole is uh, Docker has been quite like marketed heavily, and it's generally it's definitely nicer to use Docker with, to to contain all your um, dependencies rather than installing dependencies manually on your machines. It's definitely nicer. It's one step better. It's just that it's still quite complicated. It's quite painful to use. So ideally, I would like to use Lexi, but Lexi is even worse than Docker to use because the documentation is terrible and the two and the command lines are not that great as well. So. We solved one problem, but created another problem. Yeah, why not? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so you can see how complicated the Docker run command is. It's, it's not even 
showing everything yet because <laughs> yeah so you see the help is woof so much so yeah it's not very fun so um, I'm going to demo how to run a, a very quick Ruby on Rails application inside a Docker container with an Nginx reverse proxy and a let's encrypt uh, TLS certificate so yeah make a simple Rails application using Postgres database and then I write the Docker file which will build that application inside a con inside an image uh, if I can I can go through this later on if you ask uh, if you can ask me in person, but that's how the file. And then the first step I need to create a network for my Ruby on Rails application, and I need to build the uh, Rails application. Then I need to start the, the containers using all these things. So what happens if you want to redeploy this on another computer? You're not going to write a shell script to do this, are you? Because it's kind of painful. So here comes Docker Compose. So Docker Compose allows you to write all those things that are written just now in one single YAML file. And it also allows you to declare um, a dependency tree, tree between your containers so that you will start container one before container two. Like you start a DB before you start a Rails app. The, yeah, and then you can just start the containers with the single Docker <coughs> Compose app. So everything I showed you just now can be written, can be done in this YAML file. Uh, what's next? Ah, okay. This 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 diagram is how I'm gonna set up the Nginx reverse proxy with the Rails application and a Let's Encrypt certificate. Yeah. So I, I I've shown you those two containers just now: a Postgres database and a Rails uh, container. These two containers live inside this uh, virtual private network which I've created. Let's just call it Rails. And then I have a separate setup which will live under the Nginx network, private network on your machine. This this all are all on your host machine. So I need to three containers. First is the Nginx container. And I need to mount all these um, directories inside the Nginx container onto your host for as a volume so that other containers can access it as well. And then I need something called a Nginx um, generator container. So this this container is some script that someone wrote that will okay wait before I do that um so Docker the Docker daemon runs provides a REST API mounted on the Docker socket, which is this path. It's a unique socket that um, the Docker client, which is the do Docker command you saw just now, will talk to to interact with uh, Docker daemon on your machine. So it provides a REST API. You can even write your own Docker client if you want, but, but the default Docker client will talk to this socket. So um, this Nginx gen container will listen on the Docker socket for new containers joining uh, that are being run on your host to see Oh, this container says I want to be re uh, reverse proxied by Nginx. When it sees a new container like that, it will write the various configuration files for Nginx, and then it will signal the Nginx container to restart itself to use the to use the new configuration. So similarly, we have a let's encrypt um, bot that runs here that will listen for new containers to say I want I want a new let's <coughs> encrypt certificate. Then you will generate the certificate and will handle all the um, protocol challenges that let's encrypt issues it. And then you will write the configuration file, you will save the certificate there, and then you will signal the Nginx to restart itself. So that's this entire setup about how uh, <laughs> you can do it. And yeah, of course, this Nginx container needs to expose the port or ports to the rest of the world. A as you can see from this, from this diagram, right, no, none of these containers are accessible from the internet. Only the Nginx container is accessible from the internet because they are all on their host private network. So yeah. Uh, to set up the Nginx uh, containers, you need to use this pretty long Docker Compose file. And I'm going to show you how it works now. So the first demo is just um, the Rails application running off the Rails server without any reverse proxy using Docker Compose. So this is the Docker Compose file, which I showed you just now. I'm just going to do Docker Compose up with some extra flex. And I'm going to use a text-based browser to show you that it works. But it, notice that I still have to use port 3000 because it's, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's the first one, simple. This is the second demo I'm going to show you um, running the Rails application via reverse proxy, NGX reverse proxy. So yeah, the difference, oh. Wait, oh yeah, this is just to show you the, the Nginx setup that I've done just now. And that, yeah, 
it's the same file that I showed you just now. And then I'm going to just show you that it's actually running right now using this command. Yeah, and then I have to use a slightly modified compose file. Uh, I should have removed this line, but it's okay. Uh, so to tell the nginx gen um, container that this container wants to be reverse proxy by you, I simply add this environment variable to the container. And the rest of the stuff are the same. Oh yeah, I also have to ask it to join the nginx network. And then I just run this. And I'm going to open the text-based browser again to show you that it works. This time round without the 3000 at the back. Yeah, it works. Okay, the next one, which is the what I promised in the title, which is to run the Rails application with less encrypt. So this time around, I have to add new stuff to the Docker Compose file again. Uh, yeah, which is these three new environment variables. This one is the host name. This is the, my, you have to give less encrypt your email address. And I said this to true because uh, I don't want to use an actual so I want to use a tested. But normally, if you run this in production, you will not have this line. And everything else is the same. And then I just do Docker Compose up. Uh, I can explain more if you ask me later for more details. So notice that I visit the, the site without the HTTPS in front. And Nginx reverse proxy will automatically redirect you to the HTTPS version. Yeah, as you can see, the URL is HTTPS in front. And let me quit the browser. I, want to sh I will show you the extra certificate itself. Sorry, I was copying and pasting a command. Yeah, so this is the extra certificate. You can see it's a fake CA because it's a test. It's a test uh, certificate. And these are just the hashes, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, you can see it's by, somewhere it says it's by let's encrypt. Yeah, see the CN, let's encrypt. Yeah, that's it. Just to show that it's actually by let's encrypt. So yeah, can we have simpler containers? There's something called LexD, which is basically LexC with nicer tools. They built on top of LexC with uh, a nicer REST API and nicer command line tools to make it easier for you to use LexC. And then someone wrote something called Bocker, which is just Docker in 100 lines of bash. If you look at the source code, it's basically just setting up new namespace, new C groups, and ex executing them. So you're just trying to demonstrate that whatever you can do with Docker, you can do it easily with bash. But of course, Docker does some nicer things for you, like it creates networks for you. You can create like overlay uh, storage devices and the layering system that so it's just, it's just a framework of sorts. It's like Rails for building website, but in this case, it's for running containers. And there are many, many other, other um, efforts to do this. So yeah, that's, that's the end of my talk. And before I go, <laughs> I need to, I need to uh, talk about this briefly. So basically, we, we are trialing this, um, this, this um, let me, I think it's better for me to show you the site than talking about it. Uh, F, wow, it doesn't work. Can a Mac user please help? <laughs> okay, anyway. Is this page. So basically, um, it's a way, it's a, we're testing our new platform for, for you to make a quick bug by, by, some, uh, by bidding for these, these tasks, which are just like um, simple uh, programming tasks for you to earn some quick cash. So if you want to find out more, please talk to us after this. Yeah, it's not really ideas stuff, it's our own stuff. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for your point about this talk? If not, then we're done for today. Uh, before, oh, Jeremy. Yeah, just wondering, right, 
why don't you like put every single application into one container? Uh, because because how Docker is designed is that it's meant to run one. Oh, wait, wait, can I, can you refresh the question? Do you mean like why don't I put everything inside Docker containers or? Yeah. Okay, A, is it possible? And B, uh, Not really possible because Docker is designed to run one process. So there are many applications like the Hadoop, Hadoop world of data processing, right? They, they, sp they, they <coughs> expect you to run many processes together to do the do one thing. Like Spark is terrible for this. I tried to put Spark inside a container and it just, it just ends up with thousands of zombie processes because the main Java process doesn't know how to read the children. And, and it, it's just not ready for, for it yet. So in this case, I think Lex C and Lex D will be better. I've not tried it yet, but uh, yeah, that will be. So, so Docker isn't really good at killing zombies? No, you, Docker doesn't care about a zombie. Your process that you run has to kill the zombies. Yeah, that's why. You mentioned you could include that in your system inside your Docker. You don't really want to run a unit system inside a Docker because it makes it really heavy. So there's this, um, in my slide, there's, there's this, uh, base image that Fusion has created that will help you uh, where is it? <coughs> There's this base image that, that includes a script that helps you uh, deal with the it's not an init system but it will help you read the children if necessary. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any more questions? So you say that we cannot run Spark on Docker. You mean that Spark has a very complex dependency? Uh, it's not the dependencies that are the issue. It's the, it's the <coughs> fact that Spark doesn't have a client-server model, at, at least for the old version. There's a new version with a client-server model because you want to run the client inside the container, and then your Hadoop cluster will be the server so that you can call the Spark server to run whatever jobs it needs to do. Currently, with the non with the stable version, it's not really very well. So I had to package the entire Spark binary inside the container and it makes the container really fat. It's like a few gigabytes. Not very uh, user friendly. And then like I said, there, there were a lot of zombie processes that results from it. Yeah. Uh, so recently there was this thing that happened on, uh, I'm not sure if you know, about the forking Docker. Oh, so I'm not what, what's your take on that? I don't know what happens. <laughs> I haven't heard of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, can you tell me some background for so, this? So one of the, uh, it's speculated that one of the founders of Docker wanted to fork Docker and come it off as a new base. Why? Because of internal <laughs> issues. Oh, okay. I've not heard about that. I don't know. That, sorry. In practice, how do you supervise all these containers because it's not launch them manually? Uh. I mean, doc the Docker daemon has an API for you to, I think there are some tools that, that help you um, do this. And Docker has, everything that you run inside code, this spits out to a lot, so you can supervise it from that. So you have to build tooling. Yeah. It doesn't provide it by itself, which is why you can pay Docker to do it for you. They have a paid solution. <laughs> or you can build it yourself, yeah. Can we look at Kubernetes? You can use Kubernetes. I, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, Kubernetes is another one. I've not had the chance to mess with Kubernetes yet. So there's, there are two, um, I guess, competing, Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. Docker Swarm is by Docker. So, so um, the API is more familiar, I guess, whereas Kubernetes has, is different. I've not really tried both yet, so I can't say much. Find the Docker networking, their solution for networking quite chunky. Yeah, there's, there's some legacy behavior they try to preserve. They don't want to break back the compatibility. Yeah. Mm. Any more questions? If not, thanks, young man, for your talk. Uh, we're taking a break for next.